are in week three of our series called Back to the Basics, where we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Now, I think you guys may have noticed this about me, but like, um, I, I, Tom and I just have a fantastic working relationship uh, for the both of us. Uh, we don't ever want to go to another church. Um, we want to die at this church or we want to retire at this church, whichever comes first. We're not too sure. Um, and part of the reason is not only do we love the people of this church, but we absolutely love working together, the both of us, because Tom is such an extraordinary leader who has the ability to always keep the big picture in mind. And because for me, I'm just so easy to work with. You know, Tom, he could very easily be the senior pastor of this church. And I don't know if you know this, but like, I, 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 I'm a worship leader at heart. I started leading worship in college. That's how my wife and I met. I was a worship pastor at a couple different churches. I've even led worship um, at Vantage Point a couple different times until I realized that I'm absolutely awful compared to the talent that we have here on stage. I started playing the violin when I was four years old. Do you know why? Because I'm Asian. <laughs> and I was just enslaved to a musical instrument like that. But... Uh, music has always been a very, very important part of my life, at least. So I'm going to ask you a question this morning, and I want everybody to participate this morning, if you will. If you could play any instrument, like if you could be a part of a band, if God had gifted you musically, show of hands, how many of you would want to sing? How many of you would want to be a singer? Go ahead and raise your hand. Like, you have these daydreams of being on The Voice, you know, or you're like the shower singer, and the moment you open your mouth, like Pharrell hits his button, Gwen Stefani hits her button. Let me ask you this. If you could be in a band, how many of you would want to play the guitar or the electric guitar? Go ahead and raise your hand. You'd want to be like Jake Rice over here that's always like rocking out to the music. Is there anybody here who'd want to play the bass? Anybody? Okay, so like, like three people. Three people. Uh, now let me, let me ask you this. How many of you, how many of you would want to play the drums? Is there anybody? Like, like, that's me. You know why I would want to play the drums? Because it's so manly. <laughs> you know, there's something so angry about the drum set. It's so primal. And I, I don't know if you know this, but part of the reason why I don't want to be a drummer is because the drummer is responsible for laying down the beat. You know what I'm saying? Doom, doom, jack. Doom, 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 jack. Yeah, and the... So, so the drummer is not only responsible for laying down the beat, but the drummer is also responsible for even setting the tempo. Like everybody in the band, it doesn't, even though the drums is kind of a background instrument, whether it be, you know, tonally or even positionally, even though the drummer is always in the back of the band, the drummer is almost the leader of the band because everybody else is following the drummer. Everybody else is following the tempo that the drummer sets. And I think you know this, but there's a difference between a good drummer and a bad drummer. See, a good drummer under, has this intuitive understanding of when to play, but being a good musician isn't about knowing just when to play. It's also about knowing when not to play. It's about knowing when to rest. See, it's not about just kind of sitting at the drum set and just kind of doing whatever you want. I mean, therein lies the difference between music and noise. Anybody can make noise. Anybody, any, any child can pick up a drumstick and start banging on the drum set. But music is different. Music is about this ability to know when to play and to know when not to play. It's the ability to know when to hit a tom, when to hit a cymbal, and when not to hit anything. It's the ability to understand when to fill that space and when not to fill that space. It's the ability to know when to play and when it is that you should rest. And that gives a musician something called rhythm. And here's what you have to understand. They're not it's not just music that requires rhythm. I mean, everything in life has rhythm. That the universe has a rhythm. That the seas and the seasons 
have a rhythm, that the planets and the solar system have a rhythm, that my heart, that my lungs, that my golf swing, well, maybe not my golf swing, if you've ever seen me play golf, but, um, but that all of those things have a rhythm to it. And our challenge is making sure that our rhythm follows God's rhythm. That's what we want to talk about today. If you have your Bibles, would you open them up to Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Would you all stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word this morning? Break out your Bibles, or you can even open up your mobile devices to Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. We are now on the fourth commandment, and this is what the fourth commandment says. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it, would you say that word with me, holy. That six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animal, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Verse 11, for in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested, God rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. You guys can go ahead and have a seat this morning. I was really, um, I did a lot of research on this and I was really kind of taken aback by what the fourth commandment has to say. I'm going to share some of that with you today. As you and I read the fourth commandment, here's something that you and I might almost be surprised kind of that even breaks the top ten, that we are to honor the Sabbath day and that we are to keep it holy. The other commandments we almost kind of understand. If we review, number one, that God wants to be our one and only God, totally get that. Number two, that we are not to make an image of God because anything that we try and portray is going to end up just kind of shrinking God down. Number three, that we shall not misuse the name of God, but rather that the intent and the intention is that you and I would be bring honor and glory and praise to God every second of every day of our lives. And now we get to the fourth commandment. And here's something that honestly, you would almost not expect to be all that important. Do you know why? Because here's a commandment that you've never felt guilty about breaking. Here's a commandment that you don't see as the cause of any of your problems. You've never been to a counselor about the fourth commandment. You haven't felt guilty about violating the fourth commandment. And yet, for some reason, God chose to make this number four. I mean, you didn't, I want you to think about this for a second. That the fourth commandment, out of any other commandment out of the ten, um, that it has more words and more explanation than any of the other commandments. Think about this for a second. Thou shalt not kill, four words. Thou shalt not covet, four words. Thou shalt not commit adultery, five words. Pretty straightforward. And yet for some reason, in some way, God chooses to use 97 words in order to help us understand the importance and the priority of the fourth commandment. If that in itself is not enough for you to understand how important this was to the heart of God, I want you to think about this for a second. That in the Old Testament, the penalty for violating the Sabbath was death. Exodus chapter 31 verse 14 says this, Observe the Sabbath day because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it shall be put to what? Death. It's clear. You work on the Sabbath, you die. And part of the reason why you're laughing is because you're like, 
whoa, what's the big deal, God? Obviously, God's ways aren't our ways, and God's thoughts aren't our thoughts. Because you know how you and I think, you and I think, whoa, 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 hey, God, what's the big deal about answering a couple work emails on Sunday? I mean, does that really deserve death? Well, I mean, I mean, God, what's wrong if I'm a teacher and I do some grading and lesson planning on Sunday? I mean, it's the day before school starts. I mean, what's wrong if me as a student, I study for an exam or I do some homework on Sunday? Like, what is the big deal? And so that's what we want to talk about today. So, in order for us to honor the fourth commandment, I've kind of defined it like this. Let's go ahead and put up the the next slide. I've kind of defined it like this. Honoring the Sabbath must entail three different things. If you were to take away any of those three different things, it essentially ceases to be Sabbath keeping at that point. Number one is this, that in order for us to honor a Sabbath, that we have to take one 24-hour period out of our week. Number two, that is neither profit nor progress oriented. Number three, in order for us to focus our hearts and our minds on God. Take away any of those one thing and we have violated the Sabbath at that point. Number one, that we are to honor one 24-hour period that is neither profit nor progress oriented in order to focus on God. So let's talk about the first one for a second, that we are to take one 24-hour period. Now, if you are a discerning Christian at all, what you will see is this. Hey, Mark, the Bible says that we are to honor one day, that we are to work for six days, and that we are to honor the seventh day of the week. Hey, Mark, I don't know if you know this, but Sunday is not the seventh day of the week. Sunday is actually the first day of the week. And that's why you have Jewish people that celebrate the Sabbath on Friday night to Saturday night. We're going to talk about that in a second. You have an entire denomination and a sect of people that believe that we are honoring the Sabbath on the wrong day. They're called Seventh-day Adventists. So they celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday and not Sunday. Here's what you have to understand. That yes, that the Jewish people celebrated the Sabbath from Friday night to Saturday night. Yes, because it's the seventh day of the week. But also, there was a secondary reason. Do you know why? Because Friday night, duh, is not the seventh day of the week, is it? The reason why they started celebrating the Sabbath on Friday night to Saturday night is not only because it was the seventh day of the week, but the Sabbath was always rooted in the day of redemption. And for the Jewish people, the day of redemption was the Passover, where on a Friday night, they took the blood of the lamb, they put it on the doorpost, that the angel of the Lord passed them by, and so that they they did not suffer the plague of the firstborns at that time. This signified and was a celebration of God's deliverance from Egypt in slavery. Okay, now all of a sudden Jesus comes along. He dies and he is resurrected then when? Easter Sunday. And all of a sudden we as Christians do not celebrate the Passover anymore. We celebrate what it is that the Passover is pointing towards. And so that is why we now Celebrate the Sabbath on the first day of the week and not the seventh day of the week. Now, some of y'all are cops. Some of y'all are firefighters. But you never heard an Asian with a Texas twang before. Some of y'all are nurses or doctors. And you would tell me, well, you know what, Mark? There are people who still commit crimes. There are, peop- there are fires that still happen, and there are people that still need to be healed. And so civilization still needs to run. And absolutely, absolutely. You know, in fact, there was a story in the Bible of Jesus healing someone on the Sabbath. The Pharisees were all crazy about that one. What are you doing? You're violating the Sabbath. You should be put to death. And Jesus said, well, it's okay to do good on the Sabbath. 
for you, if you're Kafa, you are, you are making sure that civilization runs. You are doing good on the Sabbath. So we are to take one 24-hour period for majority of us that Sunday. We are to take one 24-hour period. Now, l- let me address even something else because there's some of you who might be like these hyper-spiritual, like super holy type Christians, and you might say this, you know what? Well, isn't every day the Lord's day? You know, I don't celebrate God on one day. I celebrate God every day. I, cel- I focus on the Lord 24-7, 52, 365. Boom. <laughs> and although that might sound very pious, and although that might sound real convicting and real holy, that is actually a statement of ignorance, and that is a statement of arrogance. Because to To say that you don't separate one day of the week, but that every single day belongs to the Lord, so you don't have to separate one day, is to essentially throw away one of the commandments, leaving us with only nine. And herein lies the differentiation between the third commandment and the fourth commandment. God purposely put them right next to each other. Because you know what the third commandment tells us? The third commandment tells us that every day is supposed to be a day unto the Lord where we bring glory and honor and worship to the name of God. And yet the difference between that and the fourth commandment is this. Yet in the process of you setting aside every single day for God, still, I want 24 of those hours. That I want you to set aside one day, and I want you to set aside one 24-hour period. Well, for what? Well, God, what do you want me to do on that day? Well, in our definition, we defined, and also from the fourth commandment, it tells us what it is that we are not to do, and it tells us what it is that we are to do. So first of all, let's talk about what it is that we are not to do. That God does not want us to work. God doesn't want us to work, and how do I define work? I define work as anything profit or progress oriented. And, and this is obviously so important to God that God decided that he was going to model this himself. If you look at verses 9 through 11 with me, it says this, that six days you shall labor and do, is the verse up there, and do what? Do all your work. So it's not saying that work for six days and be a total schlub the seventh day. It's not saying do all of your work in six days and then be totally irresponsible on that seventh day. It's saying this, that God wants you to do seven days of work in six days. (laughs) But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. That's God's day. That That day does not belong to you. That day is a day in your life that belongs to God. And on it, you shall not do any work. What does work mean? Work means work. Anything profit, anything you get a paycheck for. How's that? Neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. And here's the priority. For in six days, the Lord, God did it too. God modeled it. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. You know what that may mean for some of you? We already kind of alluded to this. Maybe that means that for 24 hours, you don't respond to any work texts or any work emails. Maybe if you're a teacher, that doesn't mean that you don't lesson plan, that you don't grade on Sunday. Maybe that means that you do it on Saturday or you do it on Friday so that you can give God his day. Maybe, maybe for some of you students, that means that you don't study or that you don't um, do your homework on Sunday, and I know you're going to have a really, really hard time with that. Um, Maybe if you're a homemaker, your job is to make the home. And so maybe for you that means that you don't cook. Maybe that means you don't clean. Maybe that means you don't do the laundry on that Sunday. Now I should hear an amen hallelujah to that. 
Okay, but, but this is the tension, isn't it? How many times have you and I dreamed about taking a vacation? How many times have we voiced to our spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend, friends, oh my gosh, I need a vacation. Oh, if I could only get out of here. How many times have you dreamed about being retired and leaving work behind you? And yet when God tells you not to work, all of a sudden we're like, don't you tell me what to do. Isn't that strange? Isn't that so strange? It's so strange that, you know what? I mean, how many of you homemakers have just literally felt like you are under a tidal wave of laundry that's coming your direction, and then there's this never-ending flood of dishes that are coming your way? How many, and what if your spouse were to come to you and say, dear, you work so hard, and I can tell that you're tired, so today, why don't you just rest? If our spouse came to us and said that, we'd be like, oh, thank you so much. The moment God tells you not to work one day a week, we're like this. What you talking about, God? It's my time. I can do whatever I want with my time. Why do you want to work any more than you want to work? That's the strange tension that's coming up. You know, for example, if you're a teacher today, how many times have you ever felt like, oh my gosh, my whole life is grading and lesson planning. And what if you showed up to work on one day and your administrator told you, you know what, you guys are like the best teachers in the world. Today, just take it off. Go home. You'd be like, I work for the best principal in the world. The funny thing is, the moment God tells you to do it, it's like, well, I can work if I want to work. You can't tell me what to do with my own time. Isn't that funny? This isn't tithing where we don't want to do it to begin with. This is taking a vacation. Isn't it interesting that we refuse to do what we already want to do? We refuse to do what we already know that we need to do. And sometimes we refuse it either because we just kind of procrastinate or it's just because God is telling me what to do with my own time. And God, I really love the fact that you give me hope and a future and all of that stuff. But when it comes to my time and when it comes to my money, that is the part that you need to just kind of mind your own business with, right? Isn't that interesting? This is why I think God uh, puts this into the commandments because I think busyness and oftentimes business is our God. Let me talk to the men for a second. I know that women, I don't mean to generalize, but I think women can feel this way too. But men, let me talk to you for a second. I think God puts this in because busyness and because busyness can oftentimes be our God. Somebody asks you how you're doing. Oh man, I'm busy. Woo! Busy. You know what? Somehow, in some way, that makes you feel important and it makes you feel productive, doesn't it? And God says, I don't want you to take your identity from your business. I, want you, I don't want you to take your identity from your busyness. I want you to spend one 24-hour period where you focus on me. All that to say the principle here is this, that God did not create you to work 24-7, seven days a week. Let me say that again. God did not create you. God created you purposefully with limitations. And God did not create you to work 24-7, seven days a week. Did you know that during the French Revolution, that the French government actually made it illegal to take a Sabbath day rest? The nation was almost surprised when they saw the, uh, the health and the productivity of the nation pretty much degrade after that. And the French haven't been able to do anything right ever since. See, it's interesting that God models this in the seven days of creation, how God worked for six days. And then on one day, he actually, then he rests on the seventh day. Did you know that taking a day off every single week, that it can actually help you? 
it can help you become more productive and not less productive. That even though you have less hours and less days, that it can help you become more strategic and more efficient with the hours that you have. Did you know that out of an average eight-hour workday, that the Amer studies have shown that the average American only is productive for three hours out of, the, out of an eight-hour workday? All that to say, it's amazing what can get done when we actually need it to get done. God wants you to rest. God wants to give you what you already know in your heart you need to begin with. And that's a day to breathe. A day to have a little space. A day to have a little margin in your life. Whenever I snap at my children, whenever I snap at my wife, you know what, where it comes from? It comes from the fact that I'm beginning to crowd this margin that was always meant to be left open to begin with. You know what I think? You know what I think? I think your children need a Sabbath. You have a hard enough time keeping up with your own schedule. Think about what it must do to a little child who's much younger and who's much weaker than you are. And I think a child, I, you know, I, I've done a lot of research. I have not been following the Sabbath. I'm changing my life as a result of some of the things that I've studied this week. I'm going to even tell you how I'm doing that. I have not been following the Sabbath. And so I want to begin to apply that to my children. I want to begin to say on Saturday, you know what? You guys have got to get it done because tomorrow I don't want you to do anything. I don't want you to practice. I want you to go to a game. I don't want you to have to practice piano. I don't want you to have to worry about studying. That for one day a week... I just want you to take it easy. Would you do that? What if your parents did that to you growing up? Hey, would you hurry up and kind of get everything done? Because tomorrow, we want you to just coast. We want you to recover. We want you to recuperate. We want you to hit the refresh button on your life. I think, I think your children need a Sabbath. One 24-hour period where you let them become kids. Now, the Bible tells us that we are to take one 24-hour period that we are not to do any work, but it also tells us what it is that we are to fill that space in with. And it says this in verses 8 through 11. Verses 8 through 11, it says this, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a vacation day to the Lord your God. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. That's what I've taught in the past, but that's not what it says. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a, say that word with me, Sabbath. And it doesn't belong to me. No, that day belongs to God. This for me was a revolutionary thought in my studies this week. That the Sabbath isn't just a day of rest. That's what I've always taught in the past. I've taught this verse before. This is what I've said. That the Sabbath is a day where you go and eat some great food. And Sabbath is a day where you go to the beach. And Sabbath is a day where you go to Disneyland. And I think we can still do those things. But here's what you have to understand. This, the the, the fourth, command, fourth commandment actually tells us what it is that we are to fill in our Sabbath with. That we are to rest as it pertains to our work. But that it's a day that doesn't belong to us. That it's a day that belongs to to God. It's not, it's not for me to indulge my own selfish desires on one more day of the week. It's a day where I focus my heart and my mind and my soul and everything that I am on God. And so here's a question ultimately that I have for all of us that we need to answer. Is the Sabbath a holiday or is the Sabbath a holy day? Because if the Sabbath is a holiday, then go do whatever you want. But if you and I both agree that the Sabbath is a holy day, then all of a sudden we begin to treat the Sabbath just a little bit differently. You know what that means? I think maybe that means that church on the Sabbath day becomes a bit more of a priority to us. 
You know, and part of the reason why I'm even saying that, some of y'all are probably like, you know what, that's a no-brainer. I come to church every week. Well, unfortunately, you're in the minority. The average American goes to church about once a month. So maybe for you, that means maybe your next step is just that, hey, you know what, maybe I, we need to make, a, make Sunday a priority. Not, not just if something better comes along, you know, if nothing better comes along, then we'll go to church. But maybe we begin to set that day aside as a day for God. You know, I think previous generations have done this so much better than our own generation. Yeah, for those of you who have seen the movie Chariots of Fire, I don't know if you've seen Chariots of Fire. It's a true story, by the way, about a man named Eric Little. And Eric Little, in one scene, is standing before British royalty and the Olympic Committee, and they are begging and they are pleading with Eric Little. And they are saying, would you please set aside your silly ideas for king and country about this crazy Sabbath idea of yours, and would you just run in the Olympics on Sunday? It comes around once every four years. God has obviously given you a gift. You could use that as a platform for God. And do you remember what Eric Little said? Eric Little said this, that I would never set aside my king or country. I would never set aside my king or country unless, save that there is a higher power and a higher authority, the one who sets up kings and the one that brings down kings. And I will not run. I'm not saying that that's where you have to draw the line. I'm not saying that that is what everyone should do. All I'm saying is this. At what point does church become important to us? What haven't you done in your life because you needed to be on church on Sunday? I think, I think not only is there this mentality of, you know, hey, I'm going to go, go to the early service and I'm kind of go on with the rest of my day. But there's this sense where 24 hours that it belongs to God at that point. What does that look like for you? It's going to look different from person to person. What does that look like for you? Maybe for you, it means that you're going to fellowship with God's people a little bit more. Maybe it means that you're going to spend Sunday serving the Lord at that time. There's a story about um, General Stonewall Jackson during the Civil War. And what we know about General Stonewall Jackson is that not only was he somebody who was an American icon in history, but he was also someone who loved the Lord with all of his heart. And in his biography, his widow writes this, that at the heart of his personal and spiritual disciplines was this whole idea of Sabbath keeping. In his biography, it says this, that Sunday, that even though he was a general, even though he was a busy guy, that Sunday was his busiest day of the week. As he'd go to church twice a day, as he'd teach two Sunday school classes, and it says this, that if anyone ever wanted to engage him on a business level or even a secular level, you know what his response would be? His re response would be this, hey, hey, hey. Can we just talk about that tomorrow? That was his response. Let me tell you how this applies to me as your pastor. This isn't how it applies to you. But I do want you to ask the question. For me, that applies that on my Sabbath, I'm trying to get off of screens. You know what I'm saying? We always bust our kids' chops about, you guys are always on screens, and we're like looking at our phone the entire time. I'm trying to get off a of screen. I'm trying not to just do my quiet time and then kind of get on with the rest of my day. I'm trying to kind of dwell in God's word. I'm trying to have God's word with me. I'm trying to pray a little bit more. I'm trying to make it so that even when I garden or when I'm painting or cleaning the house, whatever then it may be, that I'd have my uh, Bible playing through my headphones. Uh, it means that um, for me, I've even started, I haven't played my guitar for like 20 years. I've started picking up my guitar again just so I could sing worship songs. What, what, what does keeping the Sabbath, what does spending an entire day on the Lord mean for you? Here's a question that I'm going to leave you with. What if God fills heaven with whatever you fill your Sabbath with? What if God fills heaven 
with whatever you fill your Sabbath with. In fact, I think it's interesting that in Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews even calls heaven our Sabbath's rest. Make sure that you don't miss heaven. Make sure that you don't miss your Sabbath's rest. What if God fills heaven with whatever you fill your Sabbath with? If that's the case, I don't want to just fill my Sabbath with fun. I want to fill it with Christ. Why don't you bow your heads with me? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today's word. Um, It's a different take on things, God. And it's something that, Father, that Honestly, that even the pastor of, as the pastor of this church, I have not been following that great. Because I would have to say that busyness is my God and business is my God. I love my work. And sometimes in loving my work, Father, I can call it a ministry, but it, it's, it's this day that allows me to understand what it is that's really the, the truest priority. Do I love you or do I love business and busyness? Father, sometimes it's, um, we do have a tendency to just, you know, just kind of, uh, just kind of meet you and run. We meet you and run. You know, on church on Sundays, it's easy to just meet you and run. Father God, through our week, it's easy to just kind of meet you and run. And yet, Father, you love us so much. You didn't give your life for us. You didn't just give your life for us. But that you gave your life so that so that there would be no barrier and that you and I could spend all of our time together. That's how much you love us, God. That when it's easy for us to tire of your presence, how long have I spent time in your word? How long have I been at church now? Oh, man, these five minutes in prayer have seemed like an eternity. When it's easy for us to tire of your presence, God, this is what we know. That you never tire of us. And Father, the whole idea of spending 24 hours in your presence um, seems a bit overwhelming at first, honestly. But I pray that we would just kind of pray about what our next step is. Father, maybe our next step is just to come to one more Sunday than we usually do in a given month. Maybe we already come to church every Sunday. Maybe our next step is to do a quiet time on that Sunday and to open your word. Maybe we already do that. Maybe our next step is to just listen to your word all day long. I don't know what that is, Lord, but I pray that, Father, that as today belongs to you, that we would allow today to be yours. We love you so much, God. We pray all of these things in your precious son's name and all God's people's name.